Welcome to the Niche Pursuits Podcast. Today we are joined by Tony Hill. And boy, do we have a treat in for you today. Tony takes us through his journey of recovering a website from the May 2022 Google Core update. Before that, his website was getting over two and a half million page views a month, and uh, the core update have that. So uh, at this point, uh, probably all of us have gotten hit in some capacity, have had our websites get knocked back a little bit in some update that Google has made. And it can be really overwhelming and frustrating and disappointing to know where to go from there. Uh, well, Tony comes on the podcast today to walk us through a list of 20, 25, 30 different things that he did uh, to update and improve his website after getting hit by that update. Fast forward to today, and at time of recording, his site has made a full recovery. Uh, it started that recovery in the March 2023 update, and then also in the April 2023 review update. His site now is getting over 8 million page views per month. So, as you can tell, there's a lot to go through here, and he does not hold back in getting into the weeds. This is not your average run-of-the-mill type of update things that he did. Nope, we get into Google's NLP, we get into sentence structure analysis, we get into uh, a variety of different tools he used, and just some good old-fashioned open up your article, read it, and figure out what's wrong. So I think you're going to love what Tony shares today. I know I ended up with several pages of notes. Before we jump into the podcast, I wanted to let you know that today's episode is sponsored by Search Intelligence. Here's a short clip of Ferry from Search Intelligence showing you how their agency built digital PR links to a client's website. What a crazy campaign. How to sleep on your back. This campaign got us links in Huffington Post, Glamour Magazine, Mirror, and lots of other great news publications. Let me show you how we've done it. It was so simple. Our sleep client provided us with expert commentary about how to train yourself to fall asleep on your back. They also gave advice on why it's best to sleep on your back. Once we've had this information, we went to Muckrack and searched for journalists that consistently write about sleep and well-being. We've sent these journalists the advice provided by by the client and within one day the links started flowing in. Glamour Magazine, a DR81 website, picked it up. Huffington Post, DR88, Mirror UK, DR90, a massive avalanche of links blasted through our client's website with this simple yet effective campaign about how to sleep on your back. I hope this inspires and I hope you'll use this technique to land massive links to your or your clients website. If you want similar link building PR campaigns for your website, head to search-intelligence.co.uk and get in touch with them now. All right, welcome back to the Niche Pursuits podcast. My name is Jared Bauman. Today we are joined by Tony Hill. Tony, welcome. Hey Jared, thanks for having me. Thanks for being on board. This is um, this is going to be such a good one. I was telling you before we hit record just how excited I am because this episode is going to be a really good mix of tactical know-how, tactical approach that you took, and then just a good shot of inspiration. I think a lot of people are going to be really inspired by your story today and, um, and, and kind of what you made out of a, a tough situation. So <laughs> anyways, cool. I'm just yeah. really excited yeah. to have you on, on board today. So thanks for coming. Yeah, for sure. So the meat and potatoes of today is how you recovered a website from a um, from an update, from a Google update. But before we get into that, like give us some backstory, set the stage, not only for maybe what you were doing prior to building websites, but also mm -hmm. um, leading us up to uh, kind of the situation we're gonna have in front of us today. Okay, cool. Yeah, so you know, I launched my first niche website back in 2005. I launched it with a coworker. He and I were working for a web design agency, and uh, you know, we were tasked with helping clients with their SEO, and we had no idea uh, what to do. And so I turned to SEObook.com. I don't know if you've heard of that. And Aaron Wall, back in the day, I printed it out as a huge stack of papers like that, and. Um, so I just started going through it and learning everything I could about SEO and just uh, fell in love with it. And so my coworker and I were like, man, like, why don't we just try building our own website? We can rank it on Google, see what we can do, make, make some money through ads. I was aware of AdSense because I started 
uh, my very first website when I was a senior in high school back in 2003. And uh, I set up AdSense on it and um, started clicking on it every day after school, earning, earning uh, you know, maybe 20 bucks a day. I thought it was really cool until my account got banned a few months later, <laughs> like a lot of other people, I'm sure. So I learned my lesson there. But, um, you know, so that's how I got into it. And yeah, we started our, our first site together and we got into um, the medical niche. And so we had a lot of health websites that we had built up. And, you know, back then it was pretty easy to rank websites. Um, you just needed your keywords sprinkled throughout and not a whole lot of content. And it was easy to pop up as number one. Um, and so, you know, I've been doing this for about 18 years now. And uh, I've had a lot of ups and downs. Um, I've been hit by all sorts of Google updates from Panda to Penguin to the Medic update and Core updates. And so, yeah, I, I understand the, the peaks uh, and the valleys of being in this business. And so I've had good days and bad days. And um, right now, I'm, things are going well with um, my primary site and recovering from a core update. And so uh, I, I enjoy the, those highs. I, I try to take time to enjoy it. It's so easy just to get to focus on the next thing um, and not to like stop and take a moment and celebrate some of the wins that come along the way. Take a moment to talk about maybe the current nature of, and this is just from your opinion, but the current nature of Google's updates that happen, and then kind of going back to more of the more uh, the bigger, more landscape shifting type updates that happened that you mentioned, Panda, Penguin, the Medic update. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you've been doing this for for long, a long time. How do how does your approach to these updates kind of change as they've changed over the years? Yeah, for one. Um, there's a lot more nuance to it. Uh, you know, they, everyone, it was really more rare for Google to throw out an update within a couple of weeks or even two updates at one time, like what they can do these days. And so it was a few times a year they'd have some big updates uh, that we would be, have to be prepared for. Um, and, and, and there were the less people, uh, you know, reporting and diving in on the details and sharing what they're learning. And so and there were some forums that I was a part of and tried to learn from. Um, but now there's just so much information out there and people sharing information, which is super helpful to, you know, try to diagnose and figure out what, what's going on. But right now, I mean, it just feels like everybody's just getting slapped left and right constantly throughout the year. Um, trying to keep up with all these updates is, is crazy. And, um, you know, it's it's a little more nerve wracking these days than it was back in the day. Uh, with you just don't know what's going to happen. I've seen great sites just tank, and then like a month later they're right back up. I mean, I'm sure you've seen some of those charts. Um, it's they fall off a cliff and they just come right back up, fall off a cliff and right back up. Um, and so my approach here is, you know, the the long term for sure. I mean, already being having one one site in particular that I've been working on for 18 years. I just have a different perspective on how to approach uh, the site as a whole versus someone who just started a site maybe in the last couple of years. Um, that's you're still so so early in like that baby phase, that newborn phase almost. Um, but I've got a grown adult now, eight, you know, eighteen years, and so uh, yeah, there, it's it's constantly evolving. If you would go back to you know uh, the archive, uh, the archive.org, I believe, and you can look up uh, you know screenshots of sites yeah. over time and. Um, you can just see how my sites have evolved and, and so much since day one. Um, and so it's just that constant and never any, any improvement there that um, we're focusing a lot on. And so just trying to find new, new things we can try and trying to find inspiration wherever we can. It's so true that, uh, man, you have an 18 year old site that is absolutely fascinating in so many ways that you've been working on the same site in uh, in one regard for that long. Um, well, Okay, let's. Uh, we have a lot to get into today, so I don't yeah. want to spend. We could probably talk about the last uh, eighteen years of SEO for at least half the podcast, which I would actually enjoy. But um, yeah. too many good things to, to talk through. You've been okay. great about generating a really long list of the the processes or the tactics you went through. But before we get to that, let's set the stage for this specific website we're going to be talking about because we're talking about how to recover from a Google update. Yep. Let's talk about. Um, maybe where the site was, some of the, 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 the makeup of the site um, prior to it getting hit by the update. Yeah, you know, the site was in a place where prior to the update, we were focused a lot on new content. You know, I, I can also suffer from shiny object syndrome. 
and trying to tackle the next uh, you know big keyword that's starting to pop up and looking at my competitors and seeing what they're doing and there's there's always that gap between you know some of the topics they're covering and what I'm covering and so I want to uh, close that gap but also want to you know post uh, new content that they're not posting yet and so I think I lost sight on keeping up with the existing content. Um, and I was too focused, put too, much, too many resources onto the new content. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's once, once you got by the, the core update uh, in May 2022, uh, I took a step back and I was like, all right, there's something about our content here that Google doesn't like. And because the entire site just dropped. I mean, there were some sections and some articles that dropped more than others, but overall, everything went down. So fundamentally, I knew uh, there's just some lack of, of trust and maybe some freshness that Google is looking for and that we're just not meeting that as well as users right at the end of the day you know people who are visiting the site I mean they're gonna want up-to-date information they're gonna want information that's helpful that's accurate and uh, for some depending on the, the niche that you're in some niche requires you to update your content more than others and so that's a position I found myself in and so that's where uh, you know we pivoted and we took our, our publishing schedule for new content way down to just one day a week. And the rest of the time we dedicated all of our resources towards going back through all of our existing content, one section at a time, one article at a time, one paragraph at a time, one sentence at a time, and in some cases, one word at a time. Um, we got pretty detailed in how we approached it and looking at our content through a new lens. Tell us about the... Tell us about the um, like where the site was at prior to May 2022. I mean, in terms of traffic numbers, number mm -hmm. of pages, number of articles you had, just to give people an idea of the scope. And if you can, you know, tell us a little bit more about the niche it was in, even if it's even from a really broad standpoint. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so the site was doing maybe around two, two and a half million uh, uniques a month before we got hit, plus a, a lot more uh, depending on how we were doing with Google Discover. So, you know, as a lot of people know Google Discover, uh, that algorithm is closely tied to the, their core update algorithms for their primary search engine. And so we were getting a ton of traffic from Google Discover, um, anywhere from, you know, 10,000 people a day up to 100,000 people a day if something really blew up and could discover. Um, we have about 1,200 articles on the site it's in the lifestyle category. And so we, we're we focused a lot on uh, text, but as well as media. So it's uh, very visual, um, but also there's still a lot of, of details that we try to communicate through text as well. Um, so with 1200 articles, uh, yeah, that was, that was a lot to process and, and get through and look at. And honestly, we haven't even finished it because it was so big and we were just spending so much time on it. Um, but these days, you know, because once we recovered from the core update, um, I was I would be happy just to get my traffic back. But uh, we ended up, you know, at this rate, I think 50, 60 percent higher than we uh, we originally were. So um, I'm pretty stoked about that. So right now we're doing uh, close to four million uniques a month, over eight million page views. Um, and we're back in Google Discover. Uh, it's not quite as booming as it, as it once was, but uh, I'm, I'm starting to see some uh, patterns in Google Discover that uh, I'm going to be focusing on and seeing what uh, what I can get to, to work. I've already ran one test already and, and it, it popped in Discover and, and did pretty well, sent like you know, 30,000 people to it. So um, that part's fun too. So those are some big numbers. I think that that's one of the most important things to take away is I mean, a larger site, 1,200 pages is no simple feat to, to make updates to, but you were getting millions and millions of page views per month, and then that just plummeted. What kind of what kind of plummeting happened after the May 2020? Like, how bad was it? <laughs> uh, yeah, it, was, it wasn't as bad as when COVID hit. If you remember in March and, and April of 2020, um, that just tanked completely. And so that was probably the worst day. Uh, so this so this one, uh, May, wasn't quite as bad. Um, you know, we were able to to keep things afloat, keep everyone on the team. Uh, we were, but we were scraping by, uh, you know, just pull, just losing well, like almost half our traffic, you know, uh, over the course of a couple of weeks is pretty brutal. Um, but you know, the nice part about running uh, niche sites is that they can be uh, 
pretty profitable, especially with with your margins there, you know, uh, depending on how much you're investing in, in content and whatnot. But so we were prepared for it. I, I wasn't shocked and I've, I've gone through it before. I've seen I've seen worse days. You should see the analytics on my medic, uh, medical websites. Those went from, you know, uh, we were doing 20 to 30,000 visits a day and uh, they tanked, you know, to, to maybe 100. So, oh my gosh. yeah, that one was I remember brutal. the medic update. That was absolutely life changing from a, uh, an SEO perspective. And I mean, if you happen to be caught up in that medical space, whew, it was, unless you happen to be lucky and have been doing the things that they now yeah. required, you were just yeah. swept off the, yeah. off the map. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and you know, at that point we were actually doing a lot of things that they were requiring before a lot of other health websites were. So we were getting our content, they were ghost written, but they were then reviewed by a doctor and then reviewed by another doctor. So peer review or, or a, a, had another doctor just double checking everything. We had their names uh, um, on the articles of you know who wrote it, who reviewed it. We had bios. We were doing all that back in 2015. Um, it still wasn't good enough. Uh, a lot of it, it just came to you know having that trust with your links and being one of those high level sites that you know you've got backlinks from the new york times or webmd etc i mean we just weren't operating at that level um so i think that that was a big part of it too i'd imagine the links are at least back then and, and probably still now is a huge part of at least the, the medical niche for sure so mm -hmm. we bowed out at that point i knew there was just there's no way to, to turn this ship around if we were already com were doing a lot of things that google was recommending and we still tanked that's the tough part about updates, though. It's a good transition for us to talk about, you know, your site now and what you the road you took to recovery. So mm -hmm. let me use that as a transitional point. Um, um, before we go through every step you took, like, how did you evaluate the site? That's one of the hardest parts for someone, especially someone, as you mentioned, who maybe is a couple years in on their journey. And um, it's very difficult to take a step back after getting hit by an update and say, mm -hmm. what's wrong and where do I need to go to go forward? Oftentimes, you you know, you, you kind of feel like the content's pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. You see competitors that are ranking without many more backlinks than you. you. You know, so there's all these feedback that you're getting, whether from yourself or from third party data that would make it kind of hard to understand how to set a plan and where mm -hmm. to go. How do you recommend or how did you analyze your site to come up with yeah. a list of things to do? Yep. So beyond just the basics of you know looking at Google Search Console or looking at Google Analytics to look and see which pages dropped, which categories or sections of the site dropped, um, when it came to analyzing our, our content and what we were doing wrong, um, honestly, there were a lot of little experiments that I've been doing along the way prior to this update hitting, where I would learn something from a form or from Twitter or a podcast and I'm like, oh, I should try that out. And so I would test it on an article or two and then look back, if I remember, to see, oh, did, did it do anything with the traffic, you know? And, uh, it, and then I just kept moving forward and trying different things, but I wasn't consistent. One, I think the problem is that I wasn't consistently looking back to see if those uh, if those things move the needle or not, or not. Um, and then also just taking, you know, good notes and then also you know, trying it on more than just one article. Um, cause sometimes you just get lucky, you make some tweaks to an article and it pops up. Yeah. Uh, and then you try it again in another one and, and nothing happens. And so there were just a lot of little things. So, I mean, I did take some notes along the way of things that I tried and I just went back through them like, all right, which of these, these things that I've tried that I could really expand this and and implement it in more articles and see what works uh and so there were you know, honestly there were like 30 things that i we, we've done over the last year or so and um it was frustrating because we we tried so many and like nothing was changing i mean there was a core update uh in last fall and mm -hmm. nothing happened with that core update but we just kept pressing forward so you know my advice is at least what worked for me is taking notes on what you're learning out there, like through podcasts like this, and 
and implementing it. Try it on at least a couple of articles and see what happens. Take notes on that, you know, what, what you try, the date you did it. Um, set a reminder in your calendar if you need to, to go back and, and check analytics and or your rankings to see if anything happened. Um, and honestly, in some cases, in my experience, it's nothing's going to move the needle until the next core update. Um, and so that part, you know, Google's a bit of a, a black box. And so it's just a lot of a lot of testing and experimenting and not just buying an SEO course and just perusing through it and not implementing anything or you just do it half baked, you know, um, you're not fully implementing what they're suggesting. And I, I've I've done that all all throughout the years. And so um, just my encouragement for others to not do that and to actually take action and see it through. Um, I think is is a big part of it. I mean, then the information's out there, the knowledge is out there. Um, I think just people really struggle taking action. And where, where do you start? Like, I mean, honestly, I just looked at what was the category on our site that was the, the lowest performing one, uh, the one that we honestly neglected a lot. And like, let's just start there. That was our weakest link. So um, let's let's focus on that category and then move on to the next one. And so that's what we've done: taking it one category at a time. Um, rather than like just ra choosing random ones or the ones, that, even the articles that were the hardest hit, we still, there were some that we still haven't gotten to and they've seen some improvements for sure, but they haven't fully recovered yet, even from this past core update. So, so, um, we still have more work to do. Um, and that was indicative to me that, all right, there are these things that we're doing that is tied to this core update because, um, they've made drastic improvements and, and full recoveries versus articles that we haven't touched. Um, and they didn't do that uh, from this last core update. I was gonna ask you about that, yeah. I'm glad you pointed out, for starters, and if you're new hearing that, like oftentimes you get hit hard by a core update, <sighs> it's gonna take another core update to recover. Not always, but that's by and large typically what happens. Yeah. And like you said, sometimes it takes a couple core updates. Um, yeah. Don't know why, I could theorize, but that's not what people are here to listen to, so. <laughs> sometimes it can take a couple core yeah. updates. So even if you, yeah make a bunch of updates after a core update, and then another one happens and you didn't mm -hmm. rebound, it doesn't necessarily mean that mm -hmm. what you did isn't gonna work. It sometimes just takes more than one core update. That's right, yep, that's exactly what my experience was. Um, so it's just not losing sight of of what it is that you want to implement. And you know, I've, I've got a team behind me, there's 10 of us. Um, and so it's nice that we, we set weekly goals, we hold each other accountable in that way. And so when we've got a project, like we set it up as a project and we've, we're tracking it and everyone has a role and like, we're going to see it through. Um, so having that level of accountability uh, has been huge for me personally. And so I know there's a lot of people out there that are running their own site on their own. And they, that is one component that some people I'm sure are missing and that would really raise their game as far as, you know, taking action and, and holding themselves accountable. Um, and, you know, maybe that's where they can join, you know, forums or a mastermind group um, appears where, you know, they can have that accountability. That's a good call. Yeah. Yeah. You can sit down, you can sit down and look and stare and analyze and run reports and sift through Ahrefs or SEMrush and yeah. pour over Google search console data. But at some point, I, I kind of like what you said. Like, I just looked at the worst, the one that got hit the most and I started there. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, you know, it was, I think f first and foremost, the, uh, I'll, I'll mention that, you know, our content has, was a mix of being written by experts, but also some freelance writers. And so we, I, that was a, something else that I was looking at and, and reviewing our content and I could see the weak spots in it. And so I know there are other, other site owners who write just write the content all on their own. And there are others that hire, you know, some writers to do it for them. Um, and so it, I think that's where if you, either yourself or maybe someone else that, you know, ask them to read one of your articles and, and, and start there and, and give feedback. And, um, honestly, you'll start to see patterns. Uh, that's, that's what I've noticed. And so once I started seeing patterns where like I sat down and I was reading these articles, I haven't, I've never written, um, and I've, I've scammed, I've, I've skimmed them before, uh, before they, before they were published, but I didn't look at word for word, what exactly was being published, you know? And so once I took the time to read them word for word, and then I went to some of my top competitors, I looked at some of their articles and read them word for word. I don't, I mean, 
before that, I couldn't tell you the last time I actually read a, a competitor's article, every single word. Some of these articles are like 5,000, 8,000 words long. So, I mean, it takes a while to get through, but it was an eye-opening experience just reading their content. And, and like literally I would have um, two windows open, my, my article on the left and, and my competitor's article on the right. And just kind of going going through and comparing and seeing like okay i i see their approach there and and, and how they they put this paragraph together or structured the article or how they wrote wrote this sentence um and and they honestly they did a easy they did a better job at making content easier for people to read uh as well as i think for search engines like google to read and understand and so that that's the trade-off of uh, when you have writers either who don't have the full expertise or experience um they they can get kind of wordy because they've got a lot of times they have a quota to meet right and so they can put in some fluff sentences so i saw a lot of that and then uh we have, we have experts who also write content um but they're not great writers you know and so uh trying to improve their writing uh as as well something that that we focus a lot on well, you published a really awesome breakdown of what you did on Twitter, and I'm going to include a link to that specific tweet that you had um, in the show notes. So anybody who's listening mm -hmm. or watching, you can open that up. And I don't want to make you read it line for line um, necessarily, but maybe we could get into the tactics like and the exact set of things you did across the content to improve it. And um, again... Mm -hmm. I mean, it worked. <laughs> uh, it's always hard to understand what of it was the, the key thing, yeah. probably all of it, or some collection of most of it was the big, yeah. the, big, the big driving force. But here we are, what, 11 months later, almost 12 months later, and you've had you know, um, a massive recovery. But I, mm -hmm. I love the detail and the depth you went into. Maybe we could start to, to walk through some of those different specifics that you did. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, one of the you know i made a lot of updates to the content i or my team really they did so much of the work um but looking at how our how we were writing our content um i don't know if you're familiar with google this is nlp they've got a their api has a demo and you can um, paste in content in there and it will analyze it and it will give it like a salient score uh, and that really is, is looking at, it's going to break down basically all your entities or all your topics or subjects in, in whatever content you give it. And then it's going to give it a salient score. And that just really represents how important um, that particular word or entity is in the content. And, you know, I went through and started pasting in nothing. Well, if I tried with the entire article, but that wasn't really that helpful. So I started pasting in just paragraphs of my, my content into, into their free demo. And it was um, showing me entities that really, from my opinion and perspective, were not what we were primarily talking about. Um, but Google's NLP and what, what they were trying to understand, uh, if, if they were seeing it in a completely different light. And so what I've learned is that words matter and word order matters. And so we, again, I just started seeing patterns. So I would just take more and more paragraphs, put it into the demo, click the button, see what see what they, it thought was the most important topic or subject of whatever it is that I had pasted in there. And so um, understanding that like just tweaking some words, some of the sentence structure or the order of things uh, made a drastic difference. So, you know, what one a tip that I, that was really helped me is putting what, what are the subject of whatever it is you're talking about in a, in a paragraph or even a sentence, put it first and foremost. I mean, even in your article, you want your most important information up at the top. Um, but even on a sentence level, because uh, it changes its meaning and understanding, not only for people, but also for um, for search engines like Google, who's trying to understand what it is you're talking about and the words you're using. So, and I'm familiar with NLP. I, I, I mean, just to be perfectly clear, you're basically saying like, hey, if we do a paragraph on horses, um, <clears throat> the ordering of the words actually affected the type of horse entities or related entities that Google's NLP picked up on and, and highlighted and, and gave a higher salient yeah. score for it. Yep, that's right. So, so the example wow. that I've shared in the past uh, is, so say you write an article about um, hiking snow-covered mountains. If you write a sentence that says, um, it's important to have a waterproof backpack when hiking snow-covered mountains, like. If, it's important to have a waterproof backpack when hiking snow-covered mountains. 
Um, if you run that through the NLP demo, it's going to tell you the most important topic or word is um, the waterproof backpack uh, and not the snow covered mountains. But the article, the whole intention is, you know, you're writing about uh, hiking in snow covered mountains. Like that's the primary subject and the most important part of the article um, and, and really the sentence. But the Google NLP is seeing that it's the waterproof backpack is the most important. Um, but if you were to just reverse the order of that and you say like when hiking in snow covered mountains, it's important to have a waterproof backpack. Then that's when it, the NLP tool will show you that um, snow covered mountains is going to have the highest salience and, and is the most important part of that sentence and what you're talking about. So yeah, the word order um, matters. It's crazy, but that's I don't want to get into like a specific like pin your back up against a wall kind of question because <laughs> this is one of those where I'm sure the answer is it depends the classic but is yeah. it typically the case where moving I mean kind of like what you said moving the most important words and moving the most important subject matter front of the paragraph and front of the sentence mm -hmm. will typically have a positive impact on the salient score and thus what Google interprets that paragraph to be about yep that's right and what it thinks it's and how it's going to weight those words, right? Because it's turning all those words into into numbers, um, and it's trying to figure out how they connect and and what importance to give to it. Yep. And uh, you know, so what we also found that uh, if you ever start a sentence with the word if, um, I would actually move that to the back side of the sentence because generally um, you're setting that up like you're saying if, and then you're setting it up for something important, and that's at the end of the sentence. And you want to move that important thing into the beginning. Um, and I think that really that's just helpful for, for humans um, as they're reading and you're saving them time and like you're catching their attention with whatever it is that's most important. Put that in the beginning of your article, put it in the beginning of the paragraph, put it in the beginning of the sentence. It's like my wife always says, when you say the word but in a sentence, you can ignore everything in front of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a good one. That's, that's a, good a little one. bit more marital advice there though. But. <laughs> Um, well, that is a really, really fascinating tip that I haven't heard. And my mind is already racing for all the different ways I write content myself that have probably confused Google over the years in terms of what I'm actually trying to talk about. Um, how did that roll out in a practical sense? Like, were you rewriting paragraphs and sentences with this in mind and, and and was it really just let's go back and really try to make sure were you um we're going to get the salient score higher for the, the words and the phrases we want were you cross-checking that back into yeah. nlp or were you using were you using some sort of software a lot of us are familiar that like a surfer seo will have nlp um as mm -hmm. a part of their reporting and stuff like i'm curious how you kind of mm -hmm. started to roll this out at scale now yeah i made my editor do it by hand one paragraph at a time they weren't too happy, with, I'm sure, but they did it. They're great, uh, super helpful. Wow. But that was. It. That's but precise. now they're 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 trained, you know, and they they can spot it a mile away, and so sometimes it's just a repetition of doing things uh, for a while, and then at, over time, uh, you'll be able to spot that on your own. And you know, we did the same thing with Hemingway. I don't know if you're familiar with the Hemingway app. Mm -hmm. uh, a great tool to help you really tighten up your sentences uh, and not make them too verbose, easier to understand. Uh, and so we did the same process. We took that paragraph from the Google NLP tool. We pasted it into Hemingway um, and followed all of its instructions. And this was all be before ChatGPT came out. And so now we're saving a ton of time with a lot of this stuff uh, because of a ChatGPT. Today's episode is sponsored by Search Intelligence. Here's a short clip of Ferry from Search Intelligence showing you how their agency built digital PR links to a client's website. What a masterpiece PR link building campaign with 20 links in big publications such as The Sun, Express, Mirror, Wales Online and Still Landing, I would say this campaign is a massive success. We told the press that people should turn on their heating this summer if they want to save money next winter. And we landed over 20 links in national and regional UK publications for our boiler client. That's crazy. The campaign hook was pretty clever. It is a known fact, at least in the boiler trade, that if you keep your boiler off for many months, it might rust and it might get you into trouble if you keep it turned off from spring to next winter. We therefore advised the press with an expert commentary piece on behalf of our boiler client that people should turn on their boilers this summer just when the heat wave is in full swing. This way they can avoid 
a boiler failure next winter and save money. Massive publications picked up our story, including The Sun, Express, Mirror, Wales Online, and a few more dozen publications, giving our client links, lots of links, and lots of happiness hormones. No wonder that so many journalists covered our story as this headline is a massive link magnet to their audience. This case study highlights the fact that a clever hook can be applied to any insight or story to make a campaign more successful and more compelling to journalists. Can you imagine when people see this headline in the news, you should turn on your boiler this summer. There is no way they will not click on it. I would click on it. So this was the hook and this is why this campaign was so successful. I hope this video inspires and shows you what's possible with a clever hook. If you want similar link building PR campaigns for your website, head to search-intelligence.co.uk and get in touch with them now. Um, I wanted to ask you about some of the other updates you made. Um, and so I mm -hmm. might ping pong back and forth if that's okay. Yeah. I'm just kind of yeah. got your tweet up in front of me and I've got kind of starred the ones I really want to talk about. Cool. Um, some of the things you talked about are actually adding the number of categories th mm -hmm. to your website and then also adding subcategories. Um, I, wanna, I don't want to say it's heavily debated, but the, the idea of categories and how important they are is certainly something that a lot of people would put in the tertiary of importance, right? Um, mm -hmm. But you seem to really talk about this and feature it as something that was important. Why was that important and why did you feel the need to add triple the number of categories and then also, mm -hmm. it sounds like, add subcategories? Yeah. Uh, you know, one of my top competitors has been doing this for a long time and I thought it was crazy. Uh, you know, those mega menus uh, can be overwhelming. Uh, and honestly, I don't know if, how many people actually use the menu navigation. Like they're, usually they're landing on, on the article from mm -hmm. Google, social media, et cetera. Um, and so they're there to consume that particular content, but are they really using the navigation? Uh, I, I don't, actually I, I know, and it's, it, it's not too often, um, but what I found was if they do decide to use the navigation, then we've structured and ordered the entire site in a very logical way. Um, as far as how we wanted to break it down, depending on the different types of people that are coming to the site. So depending on like, say their location or their, their age or their gender, um, or their marital status, like there's just all sorts of different aspects or attributes of people, um, who just have a different background and, and, um, maybe a different lens or perspective that they're looking at your site through. And so we started to break down and create all these categories um, to help uh, really narrow down our content so you can you can find it um, in various ways. So you know we have we have articles that are in multiple categories and so you'll you'll see you'll see you'll see them listed yeah several places. Um, so yeah we probably went from maybe 10 uh, categories like primary categories to, uh, we might have like 50 60 wow. i mean it's huge the menu is huge uh, and again we use subcategories as well um you just further breaking it down and so a lot of it is redundant and and some of this i was afraid of like cannibalizing some right. of our articles because That's there are some articles asking. yeah there are some articles that are um basically it's targeting the, the category as well and but they're not really competing in google google knows better that um the article is going to be more helpful um for for people than say the category um so it, we've kept those indexed in google and they it, because i think they serve the user well for those who are trying to navigate the site and and because people can approach something from different paths kind of like you know hiking snow covered mountains like you, there are different paths you can start and there probably just isn't one path and so being able to be a guide for our readers um depending on what path they come from to get them to where they want to go mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep okay um very good wow that's interesting um Let's see. So we, we talked about a lot of the specific nuanced updating you did to the articles. Was there anything else as a part of your article process and your article update process that you were doing um, beyond the NLP type of stuff you talked about? Yeah, there are a couple other things that were very eye opening. So I, I got curious. I learned about this tool called Sketch Engine, and it's primarily used academically to understand um, language and words. Uh, but what I was able to do is, um, I got curious and I took some of the biggest keywords out there, 
uh, say like um, you know best mattresses or uh, like best cr- credit card, um, you know some different medical conditions uh, or like you know laser eye surgery. I took some of these big keywords where some big sites like New York Times, Forbes, um, you know, Healthline, etc that were ranking number one for these huge keywords that, you know, a lot of them, I mean, they're going to require a high eat uh, from Google to rank. And so I took their, a lot of their number one rankings, I took their content from the number one rankings, and I ran it through this tool um, and created basically this cor- corpus of all these words. And it showed me um, the words and phrases that they were using the most. And I started to see some patterns to it um, of specific words and phrases that uh, I realized like, you know, I think an expert, this is one, that these are phrases that an expert would say. Um, and then, you know, two, the, the, the language that they were using was more like second person language than say first or third person language. So it felt like they were, if, as you were reading their articles, they were talking to you, not just to people, to a group, but they were talking to you. Um, and so that was eye-opening to to see some of the the words that they were using and the phrases they were using and how confident they were in their language. Um, so saying something like, you know, you can probably do that a few times a week uh, is a little vague. And, you know, if, if that's something that your doctor is telling you and they're prescribing you some medication, like... That's kind of kind of sketchy, um, right? But instead, they would say, "No, you must take this uh, at five milligrams, uh, two times at least two times a week, right?" So they were very specific and clear on how much and the frequency. And so that was another pattern that I noticed. And so that's where we were going back to our content and looking at how can we be clear, um, how can we be be more specific and use more confident words instead of saying you um, you can try or maybe or consider, um, and instead using words that uh, overall just came come across as more confident um, and be more directive. You could say. And you're in the lifestyle niche, so. You're talking about being very directive from a lifestyle perspective, right? This doesn't, you're saying that didn't just apply in your analysis to say a medical query or a scholarly query, but really that mm-hmm. that was consistently coming out of yeah. all of these big publishers. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and even if you're like, you're in the travel niche, if you are, if you, if you had a great experience, uh, you know, at a, a tea shop in, in London, um, and you're going to say, like, you have to try this particular tea, right? Like, just even that excitement um, and passion for it and just how confident they were, at, it sends a strong signal just to the to the human of, like, okay, this is, this is something that's worth me trying, um, just how excited and confident that they were in it. So I think that could apply in all sorts of niches. Let me ask you about your evaluation of the content and if you if you ended up pulling any articles and deleting them if you ended up combining any articles um, or on an article level like did you delete swaths of an article and rewrite it or because so far what we've talked about is a lot of like real updates to the way stuff is written Mm -hmm. which is i've loved it i'm just wondering like actual content wise did you delete any remove any whether it's um url related or specifics inside of an article yeah, we didn't delete any of our articles. Um, there were a few that we had uh, redirected because we thought that they were a little redundant compared to another article. Um, but for the most part, we kept everything. And so we just went through and yeah, we, we cut out the fluffy sentences and the fluffy paragraphs, like just looking at asking ourselves the question, like, is this really helpful? Um, or are we just jibber jabbering, you know? Uh, and so, yeah, we deleted a, a lot of paragraphs and a lot of sentences. Uh, but then we also added in more, more information. Uh, and, and again, you know, we work with, with uh, experts that produce most of the content these days uh, on our site. And so um, once I had to figure out what, what it, how we wanted, what kind of information we wanted to include, how detailed we want to be, and then I like, created examples to send to our, our expert writers of like, here's, here's a way to approach the writing going forward. Um, and here are some examples and could give them that template um, so that they can they can run with that. And then we still have an editor uh, who receives all that and just double checks everything. Um, and so, 
yeah, it was just painstaking of just going through um, one sentence at a time, you know, but I, I think, I mean, you know, this, this is uh, my livelihood, right? So, uh, and supports 10, 10 people. And uh, so, you know, we took it pretty seriously there. Um, and we knew like this could take a couple of years to get through. Um, and so it was, I was pleasantly surprised to see that, you know, we maybe got halfway through this, through this process and to start to see a recovery there. How did you know this was the right approach? You know, because it would be so much easier to, uh, you know, build more backlinks to it, um, uh, you know, delete a lot of the content and mm -hmm. start writing new content with a better perspective. It would be like, those are easier solutions, right? This is so, like you said, painstaking mm -hmm. and expensive probably because of the painstaking nature to it. Like what, I'm just curious why you were um, so confident that these things would have this positive impact, which clearly they've had. Yeah, you know, there's always that mom test um, that you can apply. Like if you were to show your mom one of your articles on your site, would, would you be proud of it? Would you be proud to show your mom? Um, it, and so as I was reading through some of these, my answer was no, like I, I wouldn't. Um, and so that was a big, just a big part of realizing, uh, you know, I want to publish stuff that I'm proud of. Um, and that uh, if I, just trusting my gut on what that means and what yeah. that looks like, you know, um, and, and looking at competitors and like, how can we do it better? And so really just using, I mean, it was taxing just on, on not only on the soul of losing uh, so much traffic and revenue, but taxing on the brain um, on just going through all these details and yeah, just looking at through that lens of am I proud of his work um, was a big part of it. Yeah, to some degree, the more painstaking the process, probably the more you do really want to consider getting help, you know, because if it had just been you for a year now doing this, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you mm -hmm. might not have made it. Uh, you know, the human nature is, you know, you, you might stumble along the way, but getting help kind of helps that process get done because until you get it done or until you get enough of the articles done, you know, you're probably not going to see that recovery. Yeah. Yeah. And there was just so much that I learned through that process. Uh, I just, I challenge anyone to go through and read one of the articles word for word. Um, maybe take it one paragraph at a time, put it through the Google NLP demo tool. Um, and I, I didn't do it through se for several articles. There was just something that it just started to change my mindset and how I was seeing the content. And that just, just comes through practice and repetition. I wish I didn't have two meetings right after our recording because I would be doing that right away. <laughs> Maybe tonight. Um, there you go. So uh, going back to, to some of the things that you shared in your tweet that you updated, uh, four or five of them certainly seem to have a, um, a Google EAT or mm -hmm. EEAT now that switched halfway through your update process. But, um, you know, like just going through some of the things that you mentioned, um, you created a contributors page. Um, you created an ask the expert section. You paid an expert to answer Harrow questions. You paid an expert to answer questions on Quora and Reddit on behalf of the site. Um, mm -hmm. Let's talk about some of these things. They, they kind of point back to this e EAT concept and, and kind of mm -hmm. how you analyzed and, and how you went about doing these things. Yeah, so uh, the site has a primary persona for it. It's it's not me. My face and name isn't on it. Um, you know, this is a site that I think will be going for a long time, and uh, I'm relatively a low key person, and so don't really put myself out there. But you know, uh, I felt it was important to work on the authorship of that persona, and so being able to to get the name out there. Um, beyond just our site. And that's something I've learned along the way of just doing this for 18 years is like I've hired writers, I've put their names and their pictures on, on the site before, but they come and go. And what if I need to go back and update that content and they're not available to update it for me? So then what do I do? Do I like have to scrap the whole article or do I have a new one come in and just put their, and now put their name um, on the article? Well, if, if there's a lot of weight to that person and that authorship um, and their credibility on the web, then I just lose it if I take down their name. And, um, and so that's where I've decided that I'm gonna have a persona that can la last forever <laughs> to, to a degree, um, or at least for a long time, for several decades. Um, and so everything, you know, essentially is, is ghost written. Um, but it's, they're written by, by experts there. So, uh, 
yeah, but I think but, you know, setting up um, the profiles on, on Quora and Reddit under this author's name and paying an expert um, to answer those unanswered questions. Um, there was a lot of good questions that stuff that, and, and those, those sites that I just haven't seen before. Um, cause I'm so focused on the keyword tools. Right. And, and, and but it's a little different, um, coming from, from people. And that's actually one of the things on my to-do list uh, for this next year is that have our own form submission people to, to ask their own questions. And we have to ask the expert section, but those were just questions that I got from like people also ask or keyword tools like Simrush. Um, but really, I, I, I think questions are getting longer, more nuanced over time um, for a lot of niches. And so I think we're going to we'll start to see those when we just open up the doors and have users reach out to us directly with their questions. Uh, and so, yeah, you know, finding experts, I was able to find them on Upwork and, you know, I'm in a niche where, you know, they're blue collar experts. They need to be licensed um, for a lot of what they do. And so that's where I just can't find anyone off the street to who, who's, who claims to be an expert. Uh, and so there is a level of information that they're going to share that just comes from, uh, you know, that educational background that they had to go through. Um, yeah. Does that, does that answer that one? Were there, were there some more? That's great. Yeah, no, that's really great. I, um, you know, a lot of people, uh, like you said, that they'll, whether they put their name or not on it, uh, they don't necessarily go to that nuanced of a level to make sure that Google has a, mm -hmm. we'll call it a trail of breadcrumbs, I guess, about this person, mm -hmm. fictitious or not, on the web. Mm -hmm. So that was, that, that title. I think a, a, a key part to that as well is then I updated the schema on every article um, for, I have, a, I have an author schema and it shows author's name. It shows, it has a link to um, their bio on the site, it has a link to um, their LinkedIn, but also it has a links to their Quora profile and links back to their Reddit profile. So Google can make that connection that this is the same same author. Good, oh, very good, yeah. We had um, Kyle Roof on a while back talking about, yeah. hey, you know, you gotta have all this stuff dialed in. <laughs> you can't yeah. You know, yeah. leave it to chance that, you know, Google hopefully connects all the dots for them. Yeah, yeah, you really gotta, um, feed them to, to help to remove um, the ambiguity to it, you know, um, to really make things extremely clear. Uh, and so there's no question. And so, yeah, I went crazy with, with uh, schema over the last year. Um, we probably have three times the amount of schema on every article than any of our competitors. Um, even when we have, um, you know, contributors, like the, we interview a lot of uh, experts for our articles. And so we feature their, their name uh, in, in there and we link to, you know, like their LinkedIn profile. Um, but we also do that with schema. There's a co-author uh, schema field that you can fill in. And so we put it in their information as well, just again, to make that, that connection. Of course, we ask that they share the article um, from their end. And so they can, they can have that connection back from like, say like LinkedIn or social media platform. Um, but yeah, go, I, went, I went crazy with, with schema. I learned a lot from Kyle Roof as well. So he was a great, great source for a lot of that information. On the schema note, I mean, not to get too into the weeds, but um, were you adding more types of schema to your articles or, or maybe, and were you filling out the schema more in depth, you know, cause there's a lot that say a generic SEO plugin will mm -hmm. pull in automatically, but it mm -hmm. really often doesn't go into depth in terms of all the different fields you could add to the schema. Yeah. You could really go crazy with it. Um, another important one that we started to add to it was entities. So there's a cool tool called TextRazor, TextRazor.com, and you can paste in an article and it will show you all the entities that it finds and it will give you at least the Google ID for that entity and Google's entity database, as well as um, a link to the wiki data. And so we would figure out for each of our article, like what were the top two or three entities for it. And we would add that entity data into schema. We would add the link to the Wikipedia for it, if there was one, to the wiki data. And we'd also put in the Google entity ID for that. Uh, and so that is all based upon the WordPress tags that we use. So we basically set up WordPress tags for all these entities. And we just went through and started tagging all of our articles. And then we've got custom code in there. Um, that then is able to figure out, all right, this it's tagged with this entity, so show this entity code in the schema. That's brilliant. Feels like the old days of actually telling Google what your keywords were, remember that? <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's right, there was that keywords um, meta uh, yeah, field yeah, there. Yeah. 
Uh, that I was well, I started SEO right when that was actually a thing, you know, yeah. and it actually had. <laughs> that's great. Thanks for thanks for going to detail. That that's I'm gonna another thing yeah. to add to my list to yeah. check out when I get done with yeah. my meeting later today. <laughs> <laughs> um, we covered most of the things that you did from a broad perspective that you outlined. Any I'm missing though, you know, I mean, I'm looking over my list here, and there's a couple on there that. You know, we could go into detail, but basically could get swept up with a lot of what we've already talked about. Mm -hmm. But any big kind of high level things that were really important, you think, to the update process that we haven't tackled um, uh, in the interview? Yeah, so I went crazy with our internal links. Um, I said, let's link liberally. Um, I was inspired by reading uh, SEO, like help documentation on Google's website, and I noticed in the article that it linked to another article twice within that single article. And I was like, well, that's a, a little redundant, you know, and it's, and it's has, there's this perspective in SEO of like, you know, link flow and link juice, and you don't want to dilute your links and whatnot. But as a user, I found it helpful that Google linked to the same article twice. Um, and so I was like, you know, if it's helpful for our users, like let's go ahead and if, add an internal link to a related article. If we mention it a couple of times, an article link to it every time. I mean, unless they're like within the same paragraph or or two, we won't. But if there's enough distance, then honestly, I think the most helpful thing for the user is provide that link for them. If they're, maybe they didn't read that first that first paragraph that contained that internal link, but they read that fifth one. Um, and so they're going to click on that. And then so I set a goal for my team, like every paragraph should have an internal link. And we're not there yet, but I was just wanting to, to show them like, I'm, let's take links, internal, internal links seriously, um, because they're helpful for users at the end of the day. Uh, and so that's something that we, we were also going through as we were going through article by article, um, is just looking through and trying to find uh, an option for where we can place an internal link. That is really interesting. Yeah, well, we see that modeled with Wikipedia, that's for sure. Um, I don't know yeah. if they do duplicate uh, internal links, but they add plenty of internal links. They make us all they, look like, yeah. uh, <laughs> like a game in comparison. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for okay. sure. Um, hey, I want to ask you before time comes up here, um, and it's a little, a little bit of an aside, but uh, yeah. Google Discover. You had a site that was getting quite a bit of traffic on Google Discover. We don't talk about Discover very much here, but I'd love your insights on to, um, uh, you know, how to get content into Discover. I, I realize that's like a whole podcast episode, but just from a high level, like, <laughs> like what caused you to get removed from Discover traffic and then what you did to get that back? Like what are kind of some of the how-to steps to kind of regain or get that Discover traffic back? Yeah, you know, Google Discover is somewhat of a black box. Um, you know, we just popped up in it one day a couple years ago and we rode that wave and then, yeah, the core update hit and we were completely removed from Discover. Um, it's actually on my agenda to do another big Twitter thread on my experience with Google Discover. You know, from a high level, I, I think it's part of it is just randomness of figuring out, um, you know, the random articles that do show up, pay attention to those. Um, I'm doing a lot of, an I've done a lot of analyzing on, um, those particular topics, like what were they exactly? Um, what was the headline exactly? What was the featured image for it exactly? What did that first paragraph say? And something, a, a pattern I'm noticing right now, getting back into Google Discover, is that um, there are related articles that are starting to pop up in, in Google Discover. So if they um, say, one, say, say we have an article on um, dog toys for toy golden doodles, um, then maybe in a, in a couple of weeks, we might see, uh, one on like the best treats for toy golden doodles pop up. Um, even though we've got a whole site on different animal and dog breeds, but something about the, the toy golden doodles, um, is what popped up. And so it, it, there's, I'm seeing a pattern of just, of, of similar topics and, so I, I, one of the tests I recently did is I, I noticed, okay, here was a, here's a topic that popped in Google Discover. Um, what's a, what's a close, what's the closest related one that we have to this article? And um, I took that and I changed the URL to it um, and I reset the publish date. And so it was like a brand new article and published that. And like within a couple of days, it popped up in Google Discover because Google figured out that, you know, the, the people who originally saw the first one about the, the dog toys, well, um, 
it's the same same breed, but now it's about treats. They might be interested in, in this article as well. And right. so there's so just following that pattern um, of the topics and what's currently working right now is something that uh, I found is working. I, well, when you publish that thread, we might just have to do a part two on. Uh, yeah, on, I'm happy to come back on. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, hey, so remind us again as we close out. You know, this site was getting about, uh, if my notes are correct, about two and a half million page uh, page views or, or sessions a month prior to the May 2022 update. Post recovery, after Google's uh, March 2023 core update hit, you re yeah. you experienced recovery. Where are you at right now in terms of you know roughly how many page views for a month you're at now? Yeah. So. We're getting close to doing eight million page views a month at this point, off of uh, so not just recovery, but me. massive growth. Yeah, because yeah, even the um, the review update that happened uh, not too long after the core update, we saw another bump in that. Even though we've got maybe two or three articles that review products, um, we we saw an update with that, and so I, I think that comes down to um, we we have experts who are writing from experience. From personal experience as well, um, and that's a big part of what Google's looking for is people who have personal experience as well as ex expert expertise to it. Um, and so that was that was just part of our, our newer content strategy. And so I'm not surprised that um, we were rewarded for that. Um, so I think it was more than just categorizing, looking at products. It's it's what are people, um, what. What is it that they are looking for? They're looking for an answer. If they're going to Google, they've got a problem. They're looking for an answer. And so um, Google wants to show one that's that's helpful and that people have experience with. And so whether that's the answer is a product or the answer is information, it's kind of all the same in many ways. Yeah. Yeah. It's so many examples of sites that don't review products going up or down yeah. or yeah. Um, pages on a site that don't review products going up or down. So um yeah, something to it, something to it, man. Yeah. You've got to be on wow. cloud nine. Congratulations. Thanks. Um, yeah, for on sure. The recovery and the growth. I mean, in many ways, this process sent you down a very, very troublesome path of, of having to get your hands and, uh, you know, really dirty to fix things, right? As the, as the analogy goes. But I mean, not only did you recover all that traffic, but the growth is phenomenal. So huge congrats for sticking to it, for putting together that quite a process and for sharing that here. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. I think, um, yeah. like I said at the outset, super tactical. If you were listening, you probably have five or six pages of notes, but not only that, just the inspiration that, hey, you know, a site can get uh, really, really nailed in an update and recovery can happen. You just got to sit down and, and buckle down. Yep. Put an effort, stay committed, surround yourself with others who can hold you accountable. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The kind of like, so I have teased your Twitter thread, which we'll include in the show notes, but share with us how people can follow along with, with what you're doing. Um, Twitter, maybe beyond Twitter, just anywhere people can get in touch if they need to. Yeah. Twitter is the best way. Uh, Tony T Hill is my Twitter handle. Yep. Perfect. I think we can all remember that. <laughs> yeah. Pretty simple. Hey, Tony, thanks so much for coming on board. Really appreciate you sharing everything today. Yeah. My pleasure. Thanks, Jared. Today's episode is sponsored by Search Intelligence. Here's a short clip of Ferry from Search Intelligence showing you how their agency built digital PR links to a client's website. Do you remember this campaign? It was all over the news. It is the most intelligent royal campaign with over 100 links generated in the world's biggest online publications. This is one of the most viral PR campaigns of 2021. This is how we've done it. The methodology was pretty simple. We looked at the QS World University rankings for the institutions attended by key members of the royal family to discover which royal is the brightest of all. Meghan Markle came out on top, followed by Kate Middleton and Prince William. We put these findings in a press release and sent it to mainstream media and journalists who write about royals. From Russia to the UK, the US, Vietnam and Japan, this story got massive coverage, landing over 100 links and created a massive buzz on social media. Simple research, but a great story that journalists love to write about. I hope this will put you on fire and will give you inspiration. If you want similar link building PR campaigns for your website, head to search-intelligence.co.uk and get in touch with them now.